Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Every week, Travis and I review and recommend horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci fi cinema, and more. We out here, it happening. <laughs> it is happening this week, loyal listeners, with. The Beastmaster, another one of our 80s fantasy flicks. We've been slowly over the course of two years knocking off all the big names in the 80s fantasy arena, and, well, it was time to do Beastmaster. Before we do that, just a couple calls to action this week. We want to thank Cade Inversion, who on Apple Podcasts left us a review. We've been asking for reviews on Apple Podcasts, and we finally got one in what seems like way too long. <laughs> Way to let us know how you felt about that. Uh, I mean, yeah, we we need those. I, we need. I keep wanting to call them iTunes reviews, but they're Apple Podcast reviews now. Yep. We need those Apple Podcast reviews. Not gonna sugarcoat it at all. We need them. And Kate Inversion was kind enough to leave one five stars. They say this podcast keeps it interesting with informative, entertaining reviews. The hosts work well together. Thank you very much, Cade and Virgin. I take pride in working well together. Again, Cade, thank you so much. If you want to be an, an upstanding citizen just like Cade, get on your Mac, your PC, or your iOS device and head to the Apple Podcasts app or open up the iTunes program. Search for Genre Vision on the podcast store. Once you're there, just give us a review. We just want to remind people that the best way to spread knowledge about the show is word of mouth. That is really the best marketing we can afford right now. Just telling other people online, you know, through social media or just in person, your fellow coworkers or whoever, if there's anybody you think is interested in movies and movie talk and the kind of stuff we do on the show, just tell them. Even if you and I were bursting at the seams with dollars, word of mouth would still be the best marketing we could afford. It really is that meaningful to tell somebody a personal recommendation for a podcast or really any piece of art. So uh, yes, if you have friends or family you think would enjoy the show, please do them a favor and let them know. And then also wanted to mention uh, patreon.com slash genre vision. We have a couple new things up there. We have a pre-show banter from our it chapter two episode in which Travis discusses his experience preparing for hurricane Dorian uh, which thankfully did not hit him. But Travis has been doing some awesome stuff on the Patreon recently, doing some behind the scenes videos. And from what I've been told, Travis, you're planning to do more of that stuff because it's gone over pretty well. Yeah, uh, the comments we've gotten on the behind the scenes stuff are really good. We actually did a little bit of a free taste of that. If you go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash genre vision, there's about a 10 minute video of me giving some behind the scenes stuff on our Dark City and versus City of Lost Children episode. So if you want to see that peek behind the curtain, it's on YouTube for everybody to see, but we're going to be doing more of it at patreon.com slash genre vision. Becoming a premium subscriber to Genre Vision through Patreon costs $5 a month. And what that gives you is access to a growing library of not just video content, but also audio content. You and I create special episodes that are strictly for our Patreon subscribers. This includes monthly installations of more currently consuming. So when we watch stuff during the month, there's really not enough time on a standard episode to talk about it all. So we talk about it there instead. We have uncut episodes of FinFlix up and available. And then we have entire episodes that we've kept hidden away just for our special Patreon subscribers. So again, patreon.com slash genre vision is the place to make that happen. And uh, we do hope you'll join us there. All right. Enough shilling. It's time for the Beast Master. The Master of Beasts. <laughs> As Rip Torn would call him in this movie. Uh, the, the Beast Master is an interesting movie in the sense that it was kind of a joke for a while. Uh, I know so-called comedian Dennis Miller once had in his routine <laughs> that uh, HBO stood for Hey Beastmasters on, and even TBS, the Turner Broadcasting Station, was known as the Beastmaster Station. And, and I definitely remember the Beastmaster being kind of a cable staple as a child, and I never sat down and saw the whole movie from start to finish, but always caught bits and pieces of it on TV. And I know at some point I watched this whole movie in the past, but full disclosure, it was probably through the haze of a lot of pot smoke. Mm. So I had not <laughs> retained a whole lot about this. So this was pretty much a first watch for me. 
And we've been doing, you know, these sword and sorcery and fantasy movies from the 80s. And the Beastmaster comes at an interesting time because out of all the ones we've done, and there are so many from this era that kind of fall into a kind of cheesier, bare bones approach to sword and sorcery fantasy stuff. The Beastmaster kind of feels like, I don't know, the the figurehead for the bare bones approach to sword and sorcery fantasy of the 80s. Yeah, there's really nothing that sticks out about it as particularly strange. It's all sort of expected when it comes to sword and sorcery. It is just playing firmly within the realm of the Conan the Barbarian mold. And, you know, by the time this came out, uh, it was only five months after the release of the Conan the Barbarian film in 1982. Mm -hmm. But this is all so Robert E. Howard. It does sometimes, you know, an impressive job of laying out gods and mythology and that sort of stuff. But really, there's nothing boundary pushing about it. There's really nothing all of that like uh, genre bending about it. It's just a, a firmly planted story within like right in the middle of the Robert E. Howard bubble. Well, I'll agree with you in that there's nothing strange or genre bending about it in terms of kind of structure. But the fact that this is directed by Don Coscarelli, who most people will know is the director of the Phantasm movies, which, you know, that whole series is wonderfully weird. But the first Phantasm is kind of one of my secret favorite movies. It's pretty damn good. And it is very bizarre and weird and dreamlike. And I, I can't credit this directly to Coscarelli, but there are choices made in the Beastmaster that are weird in fun ways. For example, the movie kicks off with this whole prophecy about Rip Torn's character, Mayax, um, who is the leader of this religious cult. He's going to get killed by the son of this king, King Zed. So he sends these witches out to transfer the fetus into a cow. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is odd, like that particular choice to have the baby transferred from the mother's womb into the cow's womb. Like that is that's an odd choice. But this whole structure of like oracles telling a leader that a baby who is not yet born is prophesied to be his downfall. Fucking Old Testament pulled the shit with Pharaoh. New Testament pulled the shit with King Herod. Fucking Greek mythology pulled the shit with Oedipus Rex. Like, this is a well-worn thing. Disney pulled it with their Hercules movie. So, all of this is very, very familiar. Uh, what isn't familiar to me is seeing Rip Torn in this makeup. Rip Torn is rocking those eyebrows. Maybe they're rocking him, but I don't know. I kind of feel like he really owns the wispy eyebrows and the big humpy nose that they put on him. I was going to say, more than the eyebrows, that nose prosthetic... Man, thank God for Rip Torn's face, because th he's the only face that could pull off that bizarre nose prosthetic. I also like the fact that his kind of witch oracle people, they, they, they're, they you know, super sexy ladies, but they have like toxic Avenger faces. Total butter faces. Yeah. Yeah. They look like <laughs> Toxie from the neck up. Exactly. <laughs> Which, again, it's like, ah, that's fun. It's not wholly original. You know what they kind of look like? You know that fucking Ben Affleck heist movie, The Town? <laughs> they look like the nun masks. They look like the nun masks from The Town. <laughs> or they kind of look like, um, they look a little bit like Deadites from the first Evil Dead. A little bit. I, I was going to say they look like Cropsy from The Burning. Um, okay. that's... <laughs> yeah, that's also very true. <laughs> um, but It's a, it's but... an old face, an old, very old <laughs> uh, sort of damaged face, but it's all like swimsuit model from there from there on down. So, yeah, it's it's an odd choice, but it, it's definitely something that sets the movie apart. Another thing I found that was like kind of an interesting image was when Mayax is confronted um, while he's, you know, watching these witches over their cauldron, you know, witches three, like that's not familiar. Mm -hmm. Um, they, he has these monks uh, in this religion that show their devotion in a moment to him by taking these metal chains that are hanging around their necks, taking one end of the metal chain, which is sort of spiked and they throw it up into a wooden beam of the ceiling. And then they use those chains to hang themselves to show their devotion 
to Mayax and this god R. That's A R. Yes. Well, yeah, Mayax is monks that he, he's basically got like an army of Yule Brenners at his disposal. Mm-hmm. Um, just the, these bald ass monk guys. But so so then the story it's it's pretty like you said well worn at this point. It's like okay, the kid doesn't get killed. He gets saved and is raised by a, a dude, and then uh, we find out that this kid can communicate with animals in a stare down with a bear. Yep. Uh, he has to have his his magical throwing weapon, which I can't remember what it's called in this, but it's you know it's it's his glaive. It's called a capa. Capa, of course. The the, the mumbo jumbo is strong with this flick. Sure, but it's you know like I said, it's pure kind of Robert E. Howard style stuff. So. At a young age, young Dar, which I assume comes from R, the name of the god. Sure, maybe because he's he's marked he's marked with the symbol of the god, like branded on the palm of his hand with the symbol of that god. Um, the witch did that to him before they were planning to sacrifice him, so he grows up with this with this R symbol on his hand, not the not the letter R, but this specific glyph that the movie came up with. But young Dar witnesses a bear kill a dude. And then um, young Dar's surrogate father is like, you can touch a beast up here. <laughs> That's, that sounds dirty. And I'm like, I don't know quite what that means, but all right. And then he gives him a little bit of sage wisdom that will sort of influence his hero's journey. He, he looks down at young Dar and says, the gods have put their mark on you. And someday you'll find out why. Well, the, the reason why is apparently because that kid has to grow up to become Mark Singer. Who does Mark Singer look like to you? If you had to describe Mark Singer to somebody who had never seen Mark Singer before, how would you describe him? I would say he's like, if somebody tried to draw Conan, but used Eddie Deason as a model, like. (laughs) I I think he looks like if you take a New Hope era Mark Hamill, and then if Mark Hamill came to a wizard, like a compromise wizard, and asked him Hey, Compromise Wizard, can you give me the physique that you see on the Star Wars poster? And then the wizard was like, yes, but you'll also have a bowl cut and eyes like you were kicked by a donkey. Uh, You'll kind of, no, I've I've got to bet he'll, 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 it's like, yes, you'll have those things, but you'll also kind of look like William Fickner. Yeah, he does have that Fickner yard stare, doesn't he? Well, I I mean, I said to you, I was like, Mark Singer has one of those faces that seems like it only existed in one particular era of time. Yeah. And it was never seen again. It's like 70s boobs. It, yeah, exactly. It's like it's like that face only existed for like a, a scant amount of time in, you know, whenever people were procreating at that particular era for like four years and then it's gone. Just some sort of genetic trend and then poof. And I know, I mean, I've met Mark Singer and have seen that face up close. So it's like, yeah, yeah, nobody has that face. I mean, Mark Mark Hamill kind of had that face and then a car fixed that for him. (laughs) So no, Mark Mark Hamill is way more cherubic than Mark Singer could ever hope to be. But that's not a mark against Mark Singer. Neither you you nor I have the... uh, the faces that launched a thousand ships. Okay. No, no, I'm I'm straight up Philip Seymour Hoffman in it over here. But uh, but this is all to say, Mark Singer. I, I get it for the physique, but he just it's, it's weird to look at him as the kind of Robert E. Howard typical Frank Frazetta type hero. It, it's, right. It's bizarre. It's there. There is a weird disconnect where it's like somebody put a that f- head on the body that they wanted for this movie. Right. It's we- he has like a weirdly boyish vibe to him. Like when he's going around, like I, I, there's a ver there's like a weird virginal energy to Dar. Which I can only assume is part of the 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 Mark Ham- you know, more specifically the Luke Skywalker influence on so many fantasy heroes sure. of the eighties. I mean like, we we talked about Dragon Slayer, like somebody cast Peter McNichol as the lead in a fantasy movie. So like they were going for weird faces. Yeah, they were definitely going for that kind of specificity, that character actor specificity. And um sometimes it works really, really well. Like for you know, uh, To this movie's credit, the reason you and I are talking about Mark Singer so much is that it's kind of a unique choice. So I'll give the movie a little bit of credit for that. But what I I won't give the movie credit for is Dar kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah. He's um, he's not a particularly good hero. Like all the interesting things in the movie are kind of peripheral to him. They're not him. 
Right, because there's this whole backstory about his village being destroyed by these barbarians called Juns, and they, of course, have a a bat face looking guy that you, you said like everybody in the Juns is dressed like Lord Humongous from the Road Warrior. Right. They just have a black leather fetish version of that same goalie mask. And then the the lead Jun just has wings on the side of it. Yeah. So so it's like, OK, that's something. But then this whole thing where he can communicate with beasts. So a lot of his beginnings as an adult is just him collecting different beast companions, uh, you know, including two ferrets uh kodo and podo which which are names so you you know his naming is not great well and what's his dog's name the one that um spoiler <laughs> alert dies at the hands of the juns in the beginning of the movie was it photo todo todo naming your dog todo in a movie is a bit of a choice <laughs> yeah well it's t-o-d-o so you know totally different right well the, only if you read the subtitles <laughs> That's a good point. So basically, Dar is not good at naming animals. Then he gets a an eagle that there's he can apparently see. There's also like his powers are bizarrely defined in that he can sometimes see through the eyes of the animals, uh, but it's not he doesn't willingly do that. It just kind of happens to him. Sure. I mean, it, this is his origin story. You know, his powers aren't terribly well developed. You know, they haven't figured out exactly what's going on in the back of his action figure box yet. That's fair. That's fair. They haven't. Yeah, they don't have the list of, you know, his karate chop action. But so he, he collects different animals, one of them being a tiger that is clearly painted black uh, <laughs> because and I even looked this up. It's because they would they would paint the tiger black, but it would have to you know drink water pretty often. And every time it drank water or licked its lips that area of the paint would rub off. So they were like, no, forget it. So it's a very unique looking movie tiger. <laughs> it is. But like also the fact that they painted a real tiger black every day <laughs> that they had a tiger <laughs> on set in this movie is just like by contemporary standards and possibly even standards back then, like insane. Totally insane. I, I, the only other comparable thing I know of that a movie has pulled is the Cat People remake, um, where instead of Black Panthers, they would get cougars on set because they were easier to get on set and easier to train and sort of um, have as movie animals. And they would paint them black instead of having a Black Panther. I mean, and not not in the big cat realm, but I know like the the movie Link, which has a... a orangutan that was painted like brown or black huh you know to, to look more like a chimpanzee uh links an interesting movie check that out when the fucking uh. director says oh the monkey's too red <laughs> but uh dar collects these different animals and then the moment and i don't know what i didn't look at the timestamp when this happened but there was a moment in the movie where it was like i i can't i'm done with dar he's not a hero to me because he comes across these two women who are bathing and swimming uh, and giggling like women do. And yes. Yeah. This is very, again, this is all like, you know, stereotypes 101 and they don't have their clothes. So Dar steals their clothes. Uh, the one, the one who, who it turns out is a slave girl called Kiri steals her clothes and then fakes that his tiger companion is going to attack them. So he's like, Shh, you know, don't move. It'll sense our fear and I'll scare him off. And this is all played off to be like, oh, this is very cute. But then he just straight up assaults her and is like, hey, I saved you from that tiger. So I'm going to kiss you right now. And I was like, yo, Dar. He forcibly you. kisses her. And then on the ground, he fucking mounts her. It's like. What are you doing, movie? You shot yourself straight in the dick with this. I mean, here, here's the thing. This, this is reprehensible. I get it because this is very stereotypical kind of barbarian character antics. Um, it, it's it's disgusting. Sure. It's that sort of, sort of like Frazetta painting come to life. It's that male id sort of brought into motion. And it, I mean, it certainly hasn't aged well, but it also just sucks um, plain and simple. Um, it's not a substitute for a romance. It's not a romance. The movie doesn't really have any sort of sense of how to handle this romance. Like, no, oh, it's terrible. It it kind of tries to go somewhere later, but ultimately never does, and for good reason. It's just a fucking work. Um, 
I mean, and that's not really the only other problem with Dar as a character. The movie does kind of a weird job of setting him off to go on this journey. So he's he's living with the the tribe of his people, you know, with his surrogate parents. His real parents, of course, are the king and queen. Right. The uh, what what are they? The the, the Emirites? Something like that. But um, Emur is the name of his town. So he's the only survivor of this attack by the Lord Humongous Black Mask people, the Juns. And then while he's sort of surveying the wreckage of this village, a voiceover by his dead surrogate father re- restates this whole, you know, the gods have put their mark on you, some blah, blah, blah. And then he says something new. It's like getting a letter read to you by the lawyer. And it's like, if anything should happen to me, look for our enemies, the Juns, and you may search for your destiny in the Valley of Aruk. And it's like, what? Where is this coming from? He takes, you know, the the voiceover also says, like, take my sword, take my capa, and, you know, go search for your destiny in this, you know, gibberish named place. And then after that voiceover happens, then there's just a montage of him swinging a log around while Epic Music plays. (laughs) He's just fucking swinging a log. And then he, like... There's like a shot of him walking around, just bombing around in the fucking desert on these cliffs. And then it's like he finds the sword. I'm like, motherfucker, you've had it with you the whole time. Your dead dad just said a couple minutes ago, one log swinging montage ago, your dad just said, <laughs> oh, you can have my sword. And he's like finding this sword. He's like, oh, you've had it all along, you dipshit. And then he falls in quicksand like a real asshole. Well, every time he he pulls out that sword, he has to do a big, you know showpiece of swinging it around and it just feels like it's so he-man well they do say drew if you got it flaunt it that's true that's true um but let's talk about one of the best things in the movie which of course you know so dar starts his journey off to aruk and along the way comes across this guy who's trapped in a cage and there's a weird bird statue next to a tree And Dar's checking it out. He's like, okay, this guy's asking for help. I'll guess I'll help him out. And then these things show up. And and I don't know. The movie never gives them a name. I only know them as the man drinkers. I've seen it referenced in other articles as well. So I don't know if that was just kind of like an on set name or something. Whatever they're called in the screenplay or whatever. Possibly. But they are basically this race of weird monster half bird people or something they have kind of like bat like wings that they wrap around themselves it's kind of these rubbery leather wings that they wrap around almost looks like they're wearing a rubber brown robe they are awesome they're pretty cool the face you know the sort of um smooth face is a little bulky and doofy looking but the basic design and the whole concept around them is really effective and they're quite creepy it's like something peeking through from Phantasm. It's just Don Coscarelli's ability to pick out random cool. Well, and to have a really like Don Coscarelli is a master of crazy concept. Mm-hmm. He may not be the best at executing that concept at times, but he knows when a crazy idea is a really good striking one. And the man drinkers are that because they show up and they're like, oh, man, they just look weird. They're these they're, you know, abnormally tall. The way they move and and the way that their position is weird. And when Dar releases this guy from his cage and he runs out, one of them opens up their arms. And like you said, they have these kind of like weird half robe, half wings that extend from their arms and hugs the guy. And then he just melts. And we see like green goo dripping out from the bottom of the feet of the man drinker. And then man drinker opens up his arms and just bones come out. Uh Uh-huh. He's a slime and bones machine, this guy. Um, yeah, this is pretty cool. This this whole sort of idea of Coscarelli being able to come up with fun concepts but not really be able to put them into something fully functional it reminds me of Phantasm 2, which is uh, worth a watch. But it's, like this movie, a road story, highly episodic and at times nonsensical. And the episodic nature of Beastmaster is one of the reasons it plays so well on television. Who was it that said that you can kind of come into Beastmaster in any scene and kind of not miss much or be able to kind of instantly tune into it? It was some programming executive or something that that said that, that where it's like, yeah, I think that's why it was so successful on television is it's so familiar 
as a story that if you jump in at any moment, you don't really feel like you've missed anything because the movie is is presented in a way that is so accessible to these really kind of classic storytelling tropes. Yeah, and it really does end up, you know, at the end of the day, feeling like that kind of movie that is easy to watch while you're doing a load of laundry or a crossword puzzle or something like that. You really don't have to look up all that often. There aren't many lines of dialogue that stuck out to me as particularly great or particularly bad. It just means that the movie is kind of doing what it needs to do in order to just keep chugging along. And it does. Uh, you said something like you can practically feel the commercial breaks in it. Yes. <laughs> and it's true. You really can. Um, it just ha it has these sort of breaths in it that just feel like, OK, yeah, it's time for me to walk away from the television for a little bit. But, you know, to its credit, I'll say that there are elements of it that made me, you know, perk up. For example, once once Dar gets to the city of Aruk, all this mumbo jumbo, and he sees Malox, Mayax at his temple with his followers. And he's saying something about, you know, R needs more kids to sacrifice and Rip Torn grabs a child, lifts him up and throws him into a fire pit. I'm like, all right. I'm here for this. <laughs> Let the wild rumpus start. Yes. I mean, th that's, that's the kind, like, I like that kind of audacity and I, and I certainly expect it from somebody like Coscarelli. Um, and, and that, that moment of, I was like, oh, okay. He's going to pick up this kid and Dar's going to save him. That, <laughs> that basically has to happen again. Like he's going to sacrifice another kid and Dar has to save him, but he throws that kid right into a fire pit and you see it. I was like, this is okay. Uh, all right. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, there are moments in the film, I think, that are occasionally, you know, more shocking than I anticipated. And, you know, that's what sort of makes it a good HBO film, too. It, it has just enough to sort of have an edge to it. In the same way that those kind of classic barbarian stories did. They they felt in some ways pornographic, not just sexual wise, but in the content they were willing to explore. Or exploit. Yes, that, that's more appropriate. Yeah, there, there is definitely an area of exploitation to a lot of these sort of sword and sorcery movies, particularly the ones that played up the sort of, you know, bare male id sort of, you know, male power fantasy kind of stuff like Conan the Barbarian did or this did. Um, when Dar does finally arrive at Aruk, there is a pretty fun reveal of that the distant city. You know, you can't actually tell. It's like, oh, did they shoot that in miniature and then do like a, a, a you know motion control shot to to match the pan, or is that a matte painting? I think it's a matte painting, but it's it's pretty pretty decent. Like it's a fun yeah. fun look at the uh, at the cityscape. It looked like a matte painting to me. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know for sure, but but it was like, oh, okay. I mean, I know. I think the budget for this was about like nine million. And, of course, that was the most uh, Coscarelli had ever had to work with at that point in his career. Um, and, and I think as cheap a movie as it has to be, it spends its money in the right places a lot of the time. Yeah, you know, painting a tiger black every day. And Well, <laughs> well, well, more so, I mean, we talk about, you know, the man drinkers, but there are these other monsters, which are basically these men who have become kind of zombified berserker beasts death guards yes and there's this great sequence where uh dar and uh his uh kiri and this kid who's who's also the son of king zed have to walk through a hallway where these death guards are on a, on i know you just didn't forget about fucking seth dude oh is that his name sure seth it's john goddamn amos dude during that scene oh i didn't think he was there we meet seth uh as you know when we meet the uh the young brother essentially uh dar's younger brother uh whatever his name is yeah rufio tad or tar or yope or whatever the fuck his <laughs> name is well we'll definitely have an ar sound because so many things in this are r a temple of r well i mean john amos you know showing out john amos I wish he was uh, him. John Amos and Rip Torn should be in the movie more because every time they're on, it's like they get it. They're having fun and I'm having fun watching them have fun. Oh, they're instant smiles. As soon as John Amos showed up in the movie, I was like, fuck, yes, somebody I can actually like. Yeah, he's super likable and and he's cool. You know, he, he uh, 
He rocks a bow staff at one point. Um, rocks a bow staff. He rocks a really fun uh, little hairpiece. Yes. Well, and, and well, later in the movie, he <laughs> he ends up being subjected to an outfit, which I said to you would make Vernon Wells <laughs> blush. Vernon Wells, of course, being the actor who plays the bad guy in Commando and also plays um, uh, the lead henchman in uh, Wes. Road, Road Warrior. Yeah, Wes. Um, yes, the Wes. For, so it's like. Yeah, the the thing they put John Amos in, it's like, who, buddy? That <laughs> that is that was directly from some California sex dungeon shop. Well, so are all the Death Guard outfits, but um, I gotta give it to John Amos, man. He looks younger in this movie than he did ever on Good Times. It's true. He looks really like. Uh, and also, I don't know, but he looks happy to be there and be in the movie. Like, uh, maybe that's just us projecting that we were so happy to see him. Maybe, but um, I mean, he's laughing and he <laughs> seems to be having a good time and like he relishes the chance to be a pretty substantial, you know, lead character in the second half of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's like, hey, yeah, like, uh, John Amos. So Seth, um, played by John Amos, the the king's young son, this guy named Tall, actually it's T-A-L, and then Dar, who of course is the king's older son. They plan to overthrow Mayax, but first they need to rescue the king, who is being kept in Mayax's Temple of R, which is a pyramid. Basically, looks like a Mayan Mayan pyramid, and they do the same kind of thing. Like they'll go up on the steps and they'll sacrifice somebody. It's it's, it's all very again familiar. Well, very Conan. I mean, I immediately thought of the big you know steps temple at the end of Conan that he throws Thulsa Thulsa Doom's head down. Of course, yeah. The Death Guards. You know, the, our heroes manage to best them, of course, in sort of a um, an Indiana Jones meets Conan sequence, you know, the wandering through dungeons and kind of besting these these guys who were all studded out in some serious S&M gear. And then once they free the king from the pyramid, these death guards are sort of chasing them down the streets of uh, Aruk. And uh, these death guards get their fucking heads smashed under a falling gate. Ooh, that shot hurts. That's a good shot. Yeah. And, it's and I, one I, of those moments that like the movie kind of pulls out and it's like, here, let me shock you a little bit. It's like, Ooh. well, and I got to I, I like of the few, maybe the two or three things that I remembered about this movie as a kid. The Death Guards were one of them because giving them these, you know, multi spiked arm gauntlets and glowing green eyes in this mask. It's like eh, that's. Again, that's spending your money in the right place. Well, and they get so many arms to sort of stick out of the walls. It almost reminds me of that gag from the beginning of Romero's Day of the Dead where all the hands come mm. out of the wall. It was just sort of a nightmarish image. And it's like, you know, in those moments, the movie's doing, you know, a good job of curating images to show you. But they, they free King Zed, who is now blind and, of course, much older than we saw in the beginning of the movie. And for some fucking reason... He rejects Dar's help, even though Dar just busted his half-clothed ass <laughs> to save him from the fucking Death Guards in the clutches of the evil Mayax. He rejects Dar's help and dismisses him as a, quote, freak who talks to animals. Why? Well, of, of course, neither Dar nor Zed know that Dar is Zed's son. Sure, uh, but like the uh, that, dismissal not... of him as like a not uh, as as somebody who didn't help him is like this is just artificial to create an emotional low point. So yeah. fucking, you know, Dar can wander away, away away and cry a single manly tear. It's dumb, but what's more important is that there's a magic eyeball ring. Yeah, my next note says, quote, the eye ring is pretty cool. <laughs> yes, there is this there is this magic eye ring the uh what what is it photo and drodo what kodo and podo steal they steal a bunch of shit because they're thieves and one of the things they end up stealing is this magic eye ring that belongs to one of the the cropsy witches and shows you know whoever's wearing it this eyeball opens up and will transmit an image back to um mayax's cauldron and this eye ring shows up a couple times, and that's another that's another one of the two or three things I remember about Beastmaster. I'm like, yeah, that's the movie with the eye ring. Yeah, the eye ring is a really simple effect, but it doesn't. It's not really bulky, so it's it's not like they're hiding some like ginormous electric mechanism in it. I actually don't quite know how they managed to have the eye move around as much as they did while it's on somebody's hand. 
And in that, in that way, it's a really well done effect. I like the way it works. Yeah, I love when they stab it. Yeah. So this eye ring gives away King Zed's plan to attack Mayax. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so they have to go, uh, you know, Dar has to go do hero stuff. And th- th- this was the point in the movie where I did check the timestamp because I'm like, oh, this feels like the climax of, of the movie. They're coming to the temple. Mayax is there. He's going to kill King Zed. And Kiri, the slave girl, is revealed to be like Zed's, I don't know, some other kind of weird relation to Zed. I don't know. It's it's yeah, it's never quite defined um what exactly Mayax's relationship to Zed is. Maybe at one time he was like a personal advisor, you know. I think that's what it was. Yeah, like, it's not terribly fleshed out. So so this this whole ending has them fighting on top of the the big temple pyramid set and this action th- like the the choreographed action with, you know, just monks or soldiers or whoever kind of fighting this moment it's pretty boring. Yeah, again, I thought if this is the climax of the movie, this is pretty lackluster. And then they throw Mayax into the fire and he goes off like a sprite can in the microwave. <laughs> well, no, they don't throw they don't throw Mayax into the fire. One of the Beastmaster's ferrets bites him on the back of his neck, oh, which yeah. causes him to fall into the fire, which led which led to my favorite note, which is rip torn colon killed by ferret. And and they they kill the ferret, which is like, oh no, oh no, Tito, <laughs> right? Oh, oh no, Bono, whoever the fuck you are, like which, <laughs> Bobo, which, no, <laughs> yeah, right, Milmo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so that ferret dies, and the music like triumphantly swells as as Dar is crying over his barbecued ferret, and I and I look at the time, so I'm like. There's still 20 minutes left of this movie. Yeah, I had the same fucking thought. I thought, what are they going to do for 20 more minutes? Yeah, I, I, was, I was jingling like, what's going to happen? Well, of course, the Juns show up and that... Oh, yeah, of course. What are they going to do about the Juns? Well, because, yeah, they've been a pretty much non-entity throughout the movie. And then Lord Batface shows up and we're like, oh, okay. But I got to say... I'm kind of thankful that this happens because this is a way better visually uh, as far as the the setting and everything of an action climax than the fight with Max because it takes place at night. There's tons of fire everywhere on, on the on the battlefield. It's the Battle of Winterfell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, the the lighting and the kind of staging of it, it's really is really good. But I surprisingly had a little void space problem. Mm. Well, because it eventually gets down to Dar and Lord Batface fighting out in the middle of this bland, not really kind of characteristic desert landscape. It's like, yeah, there's some fire and stuff, and uh, there's a, a bridge, I guess. But it made me think of the climax of Wonder Woman, where she fights Ares. Yeah, just on a big flat plane with not a whole lot of stuff around. Yeah, and, and and I was like, oh, wow, so Void Space is not just a modern green screen problem. The Beastmaster has Void Space. Right, and I can sort of understand the movie's, want, like, given sort of just how driven the movie is by, like, pure machismo, um, this whole, like, it's you and me, mano a mano, one-on-one, but to to stage it in just a big empty space can be a little bit boring, and for whatever reason... This lead Jun, the winghead guy, wants to fight Dar one on one. Okay, um, I guess that's that makes emotional sense, kind of, because they do establish the winged guy fairly heavily in the uh, opening act of the movie when we first meet adult Dar. I'm pretty sure he's the one that kills Dar's adopted adoptive dad. Yeah, he would have to be um, in order for this scene to work. So yeah, it's. I don't know. It's it's definitely one of those moments, just sort of like when the king says, you're a freak who talks to animals and I don't want to accept your help. It's just the movie sort of stepping in and saying, this is what we feel like should happen, given the structure of the things we know. So we're just going to kind of make it happen and we don't care about the artifice of it. I'll give the movie, I'll give it this, though, this final sequence. Uh, Lord Batface has this giant kind of skull topped bladed flail that he swings around that's humongous and i immediately thought 
did Peter Jackson see this for the Witch King of Angmar fight? Yeah, I was reminded a little bit of Witch King versus Eowyn, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, I don't know, maybe, because it, it, it feels like that a bit. Uh, but there's the, the I will say one of my favorite shots during that fight is this kind of low angle looking up at Lord Batface as he's just swinging around this giant weapon. Um, it's fun. But yeah, the, the final fight, again, it's kind of a... a it's just like, okay, that's fine. Um, but then... Well, yes, but then they they feel outnumbered by the Juns. They're closing in. Uh, I think even John Amos says, like, well, it was a good try or something. And then the Man Drinkers show up because Dar was saved from the Man Drinkers when his Eagle Pal came in. And the Man Drinkers have a, like, bird statue, so they apparently worship it. It's like, okay, you're cool with birds, so we're going to give you this medallion just cause like we don't know at the time it's like they just give them a medallion and then when they're getting closed the the juns are closing in that eagle shows up and drops the medallion on dars like don't worry bro i got you man drinkers to my aid and there is a great shot of we see the army of juns and the man drinkers just shoot up from behind them and open up their cape wings it's cool i was really pleased to see this you know i it the climax of the film, of course, you know, with all the fighting and stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of expected. I mean, it's certainly no, no Lord of the Rings sequence. It actually reminded me a little bit of um, the 13th Warrior. Ah, a little bit. Okay. It's just a sort of bland, fiery, medieval kind of action-y stuff. But um, as soon as the man drinkers show up, it's like, yes, finally, the movie is sort of understanding that this is kind of what works about it. It's this, like this intersection of you know, the weird into the familiar. Mm. I really liked that. I think that that's really what the movie does best. Um, when it's relying solely on familiar elements, it's, eh, it's kind of a snooze, frankly. Again, it's, it's one of these movies that you don't necessarily hate watching from moment to moment, but it can be on the TV and you can get up to do laundry and really not miss much. No. Yeah. Well, I, I give the man, the, the, the man drinkers finale, it's cool from like when they pop up, I was generally like, yeah, I was excited the way it's shot because there's all this fire on the battlefield. So the fire is, you know, backlighting their wings, mm -hmm. which is really cool. And then they, you know, they they man drink. Yeah. No, it's all staged really, really well. Like in that moment it does come with a payoff. It's like, yes, thank God the fucking man drinkers show up. Yeah. It, and it's cool. And, and then there's that one kind of lead man drinker who I don't know. I think he might have a thing for Dar. He gives him kind and he of locks eyes with him and gives this kind of like, hell yeah, this 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 eye fuck look. Yeah, he gives him a little nod, and he's got bizarrely dreamy eyes for a man drinker. Mm. Um, so I don't know. Is it, but you know, then the man drinkers f off, and and then there's some you know requisite lame ass shit like Dar kissing Kiri because who the fuck cares? And then the movie ends, and I don't know. When we were actually talking about it, I think I liked the Beastmaster more um, through our discussion. But out of all the 80s fantasy stuff that we've covered, I think I think this is lowest on the totem pole so far. I mean, we did do the Black Cauldron, which is pretty similar. I mean, clearly, like nobody in the Black Cauldron is a sex pest. So the Black Cauldron immediately has the upper <laughs> as, hand as a point over. It. Yeah. Well, so, well, but Black Cauldron also, you know, it, it plays in the sort of same sandbox of like, okay, here are all these familiar elements about sword and sorcery. I agree. I mean, the Black Cauldron has the benefit of having, you know, animation elements, which are always more interesting to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's also subjected you know, to the fact that it has to be a Disney movie. The Beastmaster could have been as weird and R rated as it wanted to be. Um, it's not, but it has it like there's, there's so many things in this movie. And, and I know that historically Don Coscarelli has kind of disowned the Beastmaster because it was kind of taken away from him by one particular producer um, in post-production. And that's the thing is like all these weirder elements, like the man drinkers and the death guards and all this kind of stranger stuff, I'm like, I can't directly attribute that to Coscarelli, but that's where I feel his influence the most. Speaking of producers, the, one of the, the first credit in this movie is Leisure Investment Company Presents. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Leisure Investment Company? That's just, it's like, how is that not a mob front? Well, that also kind of perfectly describes 
how you're going to uh, interact with the Beastmaster. It's a very <laughs> leisurely experience. It's the Lazy Boy Chair official film. Yeah, that's a good. Way. I mean, th- this kind of I, I've I've taken a, you know using the term dad cinema to describe certain movies, and the Beastmaster kind of feels like '80s dad fantasy. <laughs> You know, because it is it's like it's it's, you know, it's enjoyable enough on a surface level. You can interact with it without having to be too engaged. Like you said, you know, you can fold laundry or I think you said do a crossword while you watch the Beastmaster. I, I don't know. That might be an oddly intellectual activity to pair with the Beastmaster. I don't know. My dad did crosswords a lot. So I immediately thought of my dad and it was like, yeah, my dad liked the Beastmaster. OK. So, all right. So um, so I don't know. It's. I, I can't get around to saying that the Beastmaster is a bad movie. It's just so familiar that it's kind of the the majority of my experience was pretty bored with it. But then every 15, 20 minutes or so, something weird would happen. Sure. And I'm on the fence still as we talk about this and whether or not I think this is worth a watch for those weird moments. Because the movie works so well, or I shouldn't say so well, because the movie works just as well, sort of no matter where you start watching it, I think you might be able to watch a couple of those cool moments just out of context in YouTube clips and get what it's about. Like the introduction to the man drinkers, you might be able to just watch on YouTube and say, oh, okay, I get it. Uh, it is nice, though, you know, once you've seen the entirety of the film to see the man drinkers show up again at the end. But really, I, I don't know if I can recommend that people who haven't seen Beastmaster watch it because it really doesn't offer enough new I think to to really recommend it I mean there's just enough better options to recommend besides Beastmaster I would rather somebody watch Conan the Barbarian twice than watch Beastmaster once yes Conan the Barbarian is great I, I mean if you're gonna go sword and sorcery type movies Conan the Barbarian is kind of the gold standard. The Beastmaster, it's it's fine. And I hate saying that. I always hate saying something's just fine because it's both dismissive, but also saying like, yeah, it's okay. When when you when you get to the point of recommendation, it is a movie where it's like, if you haven't seen it, there's probably, like you said, there's probably like three other similar movies that are way more interesting or different. Or just just better produced that you should check out. Yeah, it's um, I think the complete truth about Beastmaster and that it's it's a movie that you really only need to see once, if that. Um, you and I were talking before we started recording, and you said, "Well, this is the last time I'm seeing Beastmaster," and I said, "Me too." <laughs> Even though it was only my first time seeing Beastmaster, it was yes. like, "Yeah, I came, I saw, I conquered, and I'm moving on." Pretty much, um, but. Let's move on to the shelf where we pick movies that might act as a good pairing or substitute for our main topic. And as always, we want to encourage you loyal listeners to go to genrevision.com and comment on the post for this episode with your own shelf picks. Travis, what are you going to pull off the shelf for the Beastmaster? In a bizarre bit of, I don't know what you'd call it, synchronicity? Kismet? Yeah, kismet's a decent word for it. You and I watched another movie this week that we're going to review in a couple of weeks. Uh, We actually are doing an episode early because I'm going to be out of town, so we're recording it ahead of time. And this movie is called The Hand. We got a request from a listener to do an Oliver Stone movie, and we thought, what movie from Oliver Stone can we do that we can kind of shine a light on that nobody else is talking about? And that sort of fits more with our brand. And we've, we decided on the hand and without revealing too much about the movie, I will say it is about a comic book artist who writes a comic. Like he created this comic called Mandro and Mandro is a Conan the Barbarian type character in the sword and sorcery genre of comics. And the film, The Hand, is actually a pretty um, direct psychological examination of this author of this, you know, extraordinarily masculine comic who, you know, and and the, the author himself, like, actually states, like, Mandro is not a thinker. He's not introspective. He doesn't self reflect. He's not self aware. He, he just does. And, that sort of 
solely like guided by you know not even conscious but like guided by masculine impulse like that's what the hand is about and it's also what gives beastmaster its sort of icky sheen and i thought how odd is it that we watch these two movies for the podcast together in the same week so um i recommend to everybody that is interested in beastmaster to watch the hand it is a really odd um but kind of fortuitous pairing well, I'm, I'm going to go a little more, I, I think, typical and expected and recommend another sword and sorcery fantasy movie from that era, but a very unique one. And that is Fire and Ice. Uh, this is directed by Ralph Bakshi and uh, is very, very directly influenced by the art of Frank Frazetta because Frank Frazetta worked on the movie with the character designs and everything. And Fire and Ice is, it's one of those movies that I want to be good because it is like, wow, this is like, it feels like van art come to life mm. uh, in the best of ways in terms of its intention. But, and, and there's moments that peek out that are like, okay, this is weird and cool. And especially because it's animation, it has interesting visual moments, but like Beastmaster, it ends up being kind of boring. Um, it, it's still a really fascinating entry. You know, this came out in 1983. Uh, so what is, I, I think, uh, Beastmaster is 82, 82. Um, yeah, so, and so it's, it was like August 82, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's still in this very particular window of time when there were just so many sword and sorcery movies and fire and ice kind of feels very much a kinship to the Beastmaster. Um, it's it's by no means one of my favorite uh, Bakshi movies, uh, but we did the the Bakshi Lord of the Rings movie on this. I think it's better than that. It, it'd have to be. I mean, that Lord of the Rings movie is pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. So so if this kind of stuff does interest you, I think Fire and Ice is is one to check out and one that has a very small cult following. But I wouldn't begrudge it getting a slightly larger one. Uh, well, let's move on to some currently consuming. Nom, 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 nom. Travis, what's been on your plate? In the interest of finding out exactly what happened to give us all of these sword and sorcery movies in the 80s, um, I did a little bit of wikipedia around, as I uh, am wont to do when we're doing research for episodes. And on the sword and sorcery page for Wikipedia, there's a pretty interesting story about how sword and sorcery came into vogue uh, in that time. Uh, turns out there was a group of writers who called themselves uh, called themselves the Swordsmen and Sorcerers Guild of America. <laughs> wow. I have lots of things I can say about that name. None of them nice. <laughs> and some of them unwoke. I just think it's a very funny name. Um, <laughs> they were there basically to promote the sword and sorcery genre in fiction. Um, so between the years of 73 to 81... The members of Saga published five anthologies. Uh, and then Ballantyne also had an, an adult fantasy series. This is what sort of brought um, Sword and Sorcery back into the public eye. That, and of course, Star Wars fits that mold. You know, of course, the aesthetic is a little bit different. The aesthetic is space opera, but the structure is just so similar um, that I think it was easy to take the lasting success of Star Wars and apply this sort of, you know, resurgence in popularity of, of this stuff, you know, the, of the sword and sorcery stuff. It's like, okay, yeah, let's, let's put this and this together and, and make banks. So I would recommend uh, this article on Wikipedia to anybody who's interested in the sword and sorcery genre. I really don't know how much sword and sorcery we're going to be doing on the show after this point. I feel like we've kind of reached a point where we've found all the sword and sorcery movies that are popular enough to do from we've this, done the from big this targets i feel we've hit the high points for sure the sort of fan favorites we haven't done an episode on conan the barbarian but it would just like here's the episode we love conan the barbarian it'd just be you and i for like an hour singing the basil polidora score that's true i mean that score is fantastic so so we fucking we really don't have Arnold. a lot to we don't really have a lot to add to the conversation or analyze about Conan the Barbarian other than Conan the Barbarian is a really fun time. And to tie into your uh, your shelf pick of The Hand, that writer-director of The Hand, Oliver Stone, worked on the script for Conan the Barbarian. Yep. So 
It was also, I think, a, a resurgence of hypermasculinity at the movies. I mean, this is pretty documented after the sort of more nuanced explorations of masculinity in 70s cinema, 80s cinema went back to like hyper masculine, like freaking raging gun boner shit. Sure. Um, and, and this is, you know, perfectly at home. And then that, that 1982 era stuff, it's like, this is when Predator was basically the new Viagra. Well, this is just the rise of Arnold and Stallone and, you know, just all of that kind of hyper masculinity. Yeah. Yeah. On a completely different note, I also wanted to mention a YouTube video from film critic Patrick H. Willems. He wanted to make a video about Hayao Miyazaki's film Kiki's Delivery Service, which I've never seen. But the video makes a really great point um, about the topic of the movie. And basically, it's a story, you know, well, Patrick H. Willems tells us a story about how he was able to relate more to this film that he originally thought was intended for children the older he got. And this is something I feel like um, is is sort of a universal experience that we all sort of, we all start to go back and reconsume all this stuff that we found when we were younger and then discover it's like, Oh, this is adults telling a story about how they feel using the framework of a children's movie. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he makes the point that Kiki's delivery service is about burnout. It's about work burnout. And um, it's like, yeah, this is um, this is a really, really strong argument. And of course, it's Patrick H. Willems. Like his video essays are just immaculately put together. Uh, I highly recommend anybody watch that. And, you know, even though I haven't seen Kiki's Delivery Service yet, it is now near the top of my list of movies to watch next. Nice. So uh, what have you been consuming? Uh, well, I will do a little bit of self-shilling here. If you go to genrevision.com, you can read the review that I did for Shudder's Creep Show series. The older I get, the more I'm kind of settling into calling Creep Show my favorite horror movie. It's been with me for such a long time, and the older I get, I just really love what it does and what it is. So you would say Creep Show now competes with Jaws as your favorite movie? Well, you know, Jaws is a horror movie, but Jaws is like it's bigger than one genre. Um, sure. Like, like creep show is something representative of the horror genre. I would say it's my favorite horror movie. Okay. Um, you know, jaws is like jaws is everything to me. It's like, it's, it is a horror movie, but it's also adventure. It's a great, you know, human drama. It's a genre it's, sampler platter, basically. Yeah. It's everything. Um, it transcends genre to me. But Creep Show is this movie that is just I'm like, man, if, if I could make one horror movie, I would want it to be like this. And, and you know, the one credit I have on IMDb is an anthology horror movie. So I, I feel very deeply connected to that subgenre of, of horror. And Shudder had this new Creep Show series coming out, and I was very much anticipating it. Uh, you know, the people behind it, Greg, you know, Greg Nicotero is kind of the, the captain of the ship, and they're doing a lot of adaptations of short stories, which is, I think, the right way to go with this kind of stuff. Um, yes. There's, there, there's a couple of original stories in there as well. Um, but just because the field of anthology horror has changed so much over the last decade, where it's really become about kind of serialized seasons or singular, more cinematic experiences, and I talk about that in my review, that the old school anthology horror that I grew up with, which was stuff like creep show and are you afraid of the dark and tales from the crypt that's kind of gone out of fashion that's not what people are really interested in anymore and man shutter's creep show just comes back with a vengeance and and a such a clear deli- this is kind of basically a new tales from the crypt which tales from the crypt i don't think would have existed if creep show hadn't happened it sounds awful tempting i may have to reignite my uh my shutter subscription. They have the the creep as as he's known in in the movie as the kind of host between segments segments. It doesn't it you know the creep doesn't talk like the creep keeper would, but they're still they find ways to interject humor with this you know totally physical puppet that they're using, and that's where you'll see a lot of kind of the stylized comic book Mario Bava esque lighting that that Creep Show the original film is known for. Um, the first episode adapts two short stories. The first one by Stephen King, gray matter. Uh, and then the second one, which I actually liked more, which was called 
um, the house of the head. I think I called it in my review. Like this is, are you afraid of the dark for the adults who grew up on? Are you afraid of the dark? Hmm. Like it has that same kind of fun energy, but it's allowed to discuss some, some other things as far as adult subject matter goes, but not in a, you know, crass or exploitative way. It's just like, yeah, it's got that same kind of fun campfire energy that I think has been missing from anthology horror for so long. It really feels celebratory. And I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy that the early reviews along with mine have been, I thought I was going to be like the lone voice out in the woods. Like this is really hitting the mark. But the critical reaction, the early critical reaction has been equally positive. That's nice to see because, I mean, like we all know you're a sucker for creep show. It's true. I mean, I, I'm 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 very in the bag, but as in the bag as I am, it's also something that I'm very, very critical of. Like, I don't like creep show, too. I just did an episode on Chat Cemetery about Tales from the Dark Side, which is pretty much the official creep show three. Mm-hmm. And even that's a little shaky. It's got its moments, but yeah. It does. It does. But... This one, I'm like, this is the first time I've really felt the people behind it understand the spirit because the spirit is the most important thing to me. I I don't necessarily need all of the particular, you know, kind of formalist choices that that the the, the first creep show movie made. Like, I love those. Yeah. I mean, it's just such strong formalist choices, though, like that that desire to recreate the EC Comics thing is of course within that the context of that first film like it's wonderful to see that style so present throughout all of the movie and for all of the movie to feel so stylistically strong and consistent i think updating it into a modern version of the show that also functions as a throwback it's like nah, the show is going to have to explore more aesthetics i just hope that they're i just hope that they're as stylistically strong you know even even if they're not doing the same thing I think you'll see that in the first episode because each episode is going to have two tales, which is great. So it's basically two kind of 20, 22 minute stories Mm. um, put together as one. And you'll see just from that, it's like, because of course they have different directors and it really feels like the directive was you can make this look and feel like your own thing, but the spirit of it has to all connect together. And that's the best thing I can say about Shudder's Creep Show is that it it captures the spirit. Like I, I think I said in my review, like it's as simple as this. Shutter's Creep Show gets it. Like it, it it feels. I hate to use this, you know, marketing term, but it feels like a real for fans by fans type product, um, and not in a surface devoted way. In a thing like we understand the heart of this. The heart is more important than anything else, and if we nail that, everything else we can play with in our own way. So I, I really hope it does well. You know, it's going to be a great treat to have that coming out, you know, throughout all of October. You know, they're doing weekly releases. I'm excited. I'm really excited. And I hope I hope the following episodes are as good as the ones I watch. So and let's finish things off with our comments of the week for last week's episode on Dark City versus the City of Lost Children. Who, buddy, did we get a lot of shelf picks? I'm so I'm so stoked that this has taken off with you loyal listeners. So we've got shelf picks from T-Bones McRoanoke, whose shelf pick was The Crow, another Alex Proyas movie, which, yeah, watch The Crow. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good movie. Ryan Covey, whose shelf pick was Equilibrium, uh, which he said is another movie that's impeccably designed and seems very deep until you think about it for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, okay. I mean, he does say it's like, uh, I've, it's been a while since I've seen dark city, but I did not care for it. It became the pinnacle of stylistic shallow movie that thinks it's super deep. I don't think that read on the movie is unwarranted. I don't think it's a terribly deep movie. I, I definitely agree with him on that, but, um, I don't know if dark city holds, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if dark city has a delusion of thinking it's really, really smart. I don't know, but, but equilibrium just, it, it is, is really stylish. But Equilibrium is a good pick for that. Uh, I would agree. Yeah, it's that is uh, he makes like with the points he makes, it definitely makes Equilibrium a good pick. Uh, Mr. Milksteak had two shelf picks, which are Prometheus and Hellraiser, as he said, soft shelf picks. 
Uh, Dark City's The Strangers seem to use the Cenobites' tailor, while the Engineers and Strangers both share an appreciation for gigantic head sculptures. This is they do true. indeed, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, DT Grizzler, their shelf pick was The Adjustment Bureau, which does not work nearly as well as Dark City, but uses a similar plot device. I have never seen the Adjustment Bureau. <laughs> Neither have I. Also, what a bad name for a movie, right? Well, I think it's I think it's taken from the the Philip K. Dick story. But if as you'll notice, a lot of Philip K. Dick stories they did not use the titles for in the movie adaptation. Hence, Blade Runner. Thank you, Blade Runner and Total Recall. Mm-hmm. Um, that was we can remember it for, for you, you wholesale. wholesale. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then J T. Uh, J T. Kennel. Uh, their shelf pick was. The peanut butter solution, which... Hold, I'm sorry. Peanut? The peanut. <laughs> the peanut butter solution. You want me to say peanut? You know what? It's a legume. Maybe it doesn't matter. That's true. It could be a knit. It could be, it's, it's just as much of a knit as it is a nut, so it's neither. <laughs> so there you go. The peanut butter solution, <laughs> which... Uh, which JT said. He said the P nut butter <laughs> <laughs> uh, You want me to get specific on semantics? I will. Um, the everyone's favorite legume butter solution. Yes. Um, in case anyone isn't familiar with it, it uh, this is JT Kennel. Uh, it revolves around a kid who loses his hair due to fright and the hair growth formula that results in his hair growing out of control. So it's he's not about George Washington Carver. No, he's eventually kidnapped by a disgraced teacher who uses his hair as a never-ending supply to make special paintbrushes. I have seen this movie. So have I. I don't remember it, though. I remember getting it from the library as a kid. But, like, these details about the disgraced teacher and shit like that, I don't remember a damn thing about that. This is a fascinatingly weird movie. Because it's not really... like. It's a horror movie, but only because it is so strange to towards its intended audience. And all I remember that one of the things, because I didn't see it as a kid. I saw it as an adult when I kind of heard about this movie, like everybody being like, oh, my God, this it, 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 it was spoken about as one of those like. If you know what I'm talking about, it's like this secret that we shared, like shared trauma or something. Um, and I saw it and the only, the one big thing I remember from it is when they get this hair growth formula, the kid has some friend and the friend is like, do you think it'll make your hair grow down there? And then he just points to his crotch and I was like, what, what's going on? <laughs> so, so it's just as, uh, off puttingly bizarre as dark city and city of lost children. Uh, and then finally, Nick Thornsack, who's also our comment of the week, their shelf pick was City of Ember, if only to see what a half-failed attempt at the same 100% production design, 100% set shoot approach is like, albeit from a more YA approach. Um, they also said not quite shelf double feature Delicatessen and the Crow, which are both, you know, Alex Proyas and Jean-Pierre Jeunet, both good movies. Uh, but Nick Thornsack also said... Hey, great show. Sorry I've been away from the genreverse for so long. Both are 100% formative masterpieces that I was lucky enough to see on cinema release. I am old now. <laughs> well, it's okay, Nick Thornsack. We're, we're glad to have you back. We haven't seen you in a while, so, so thanks for commenting. Uh, and I think that's going to wrap it up for this week. Next week, Travis, who are we going to be visiting with again? Well, it's an old friend. Um, he, he goes by the name... Of Neil Breen. It's time again, loyal listeners. We are doing Pass Through, the next film in our ongoing saga to try and understand Neil Breen. I, I don't know. I think we have a pretty good grasp on Neil Breen's whole. Don't, <laughs> as soon as you say that, now we have to see this movie and things will change. Because <laughs> there's always before you saw a Neil Breen movie and after. So. You know, you speak the truth on this one, and I cannot wait until the after. Uh, I will be a new man. We, we all will. So we hope you'll join us for that next week. As always, we want to thank you so much for listening. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And we'll see you next week. Right here on Genre Vision. Genre Vision.